In this little PowerPoint, we will talk about two things, uh, limiting and excess reagents and percentiles. Uh, limiting and excess reagents are calculated exactly the same way as stoichiometry would be uh, calculated and stoichiometry you've done before. So the setup is the same, which is like converting grams into moles and then mole ratio, uh, etc. except that in limiting and excess reagents, you're doing it for both the starting materials or three starting materials, whatever it is, okay? And then we will also talk about percentiles, which talks about efficiency of a reaction. How efficient is your reaction? whether it's only 20% or 90%. Okay, so that is what we're going to talk about um, in this uh, little PowerPoint. Now for uh, limiting reagent problems. Limiting reagent problems are any in which you have more than one starting material. Okay, so the one that we did just before about propane and oxygen, there were two starting materials there, but the question was not asking us for both starting materials. We only had one starting material given to us, but if both were given to us, then we will have a limiting reagent problem. And a limiting reagent is one which is entirely consumed when a reaction goes to completion, which means that when the limiting reagent is over, reaction is over, okay? And so you can actually have um, the other reagent left over, okay? And that is excess that's left over, but we call these limiting reagent problems because the limiting reagent is the one that actually causes the reaction to stop, not the excess one. So um, everything that you work with then, which means that uh, whether you're trying to calculate for the product, whether you're trying to calculate of how much of the other reagent you use, everything is determined by the limiting reactant. So this is the important thing. This is where you need to find out um, how much of the limiting reactant you had. So how do you find that out? You calculate, you, you take uh, each of the amounts that is given to you, and then you calculate the amount of product that will be formed from each of them, okay? And the lesser product will be, of course, from the limiting reactant. Whatever you were able to get more of is obviously coming from the reagent that was more. So the limiting reagent should actually give you less of the product, okay? So um, let's go ahead and do some problem and see um, if we get this. So here is the problem. Magnesium uh, metal is used to prepare zirconium metal, which is used to make a container for nuclear fuel. And here is the reaction that's given to us, uh, zirconium uh, tetrachloride or zirconium chloride with mag uh, magnesium metal to give magnesium chloride and zirconium. How many moles of zirconium metal can be produced? So this is the final product from a reaction mixture containing 0.2 moles of zirconium chloride and 0.5 moles of magnesium. So make a note that we are actually calculating from moles over here and not grams. If we had grams given to us, we would be converting that to moles first. So one step is already done for us, okay? Which means we already have the moles uh, given to us. So 0.2 moles of zirconium chloride and then 0.5 moles of magnesium. So what we're going to do now is we'll take the moles of zirconium chloride, convert that into the moles of zirconium that are being formed and then take the moles of magnesium and then do the mole ratio and find out how many moles of zirconium will be formed. Remember these mole ratios, they are coming from the balanced equation, okay? So one mole of zirconium chloride gives one mole of zirconium, whereas one mole of zirconium, zirconium is being produced by two moles of magnesium. So looking at these two numbers over here, you can see that 0.2 moles is a smaller number than 0.25, which means that the zirconium chloride is our limiting reagent because this is giving the smaller quantity of zirconium, whereas the magnesium is our excess reagent, okay? So then finally, this is what our answer will be. And zirconium chloride is what we call the limiting reagent. Then we don't call this one an excess reagent, but we just call zirconium chloride as our limiting reagent. Usually that's how the problem is also asked of you, is which is the limiting reagent. So that's what you calculate for. Here, the question is not being asked of you in grams. So it says how many moles of zirconium metal. So you can leave that answer as moles. Okay, so that's your answer here. Another problem here, um, urea again okay as we did before so we have urea uh, carbon dioxide and ammonia combining to give urea and water 
So here is the problem. In a lab experiment, 10 grams of ammonia and 10 grams of carbon dioxide were added. So what is the maximum quantity of urea that can be obtained? And then how many grams of excess reactants are left over? Okay, in this case. So that's a two-part problem. So the first thing you have to do is to figure out the limiting reagent. So first calculate all the molar masses as we have been before. Okay, so ammonia, one nitrogen, three hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then you start setting up your problem. So you start with any one chemical. You don't have to start with ammonia. You can start with carbon dioxide. But 10 grams of ammonia, convert that into moles of ammonia. So moles on the top, grams at the bottom. Moles of ammonia down here now. And uh, this is the mole ratio to urea because that's what you're calculating for. Again, these numbers are coming from the balanced equation. One mole of urea is obtained from two moles of ammonia, okay, as given from the balanced equation. Convert these moles of urea to grams of urea, and you get 17.6 grams of um, urea. Then you do the same kind of setup for uh, carbon dioxide, okay, where we have uh, 10 grams of carbon dioxide. Convert that to moles using the formula mass of carbon dioxide. Now, one mole of urea is produced from one mole of carbon dioxide as given by the equation. And then convert um, the urea back to grams, okay? And you get 13.6 gram of urea produced from 10 grams of carbon dioxide. Looking at the two numbers that you've calculated, 17.6 grams of urea coming from 10 grams of ammonia and then 13.6 grams of urea coming from 10 grams of carbon dioxide. It's clear that 10 grams of carbon dioxide gives us less amount of urea. Therefore, 10 grams of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide here in this reaction, in this problem, is our limiting reagent. Okay, so that's the answer to part one of our problem. Okay, and then the answer is... 13.6 grams of urea will be produced. That's what the question was. What is the maximum quantity of urea that can be obtained? Now for the second part, how many grams of excess reactant are left at the end? Okay, I'm going to stay on this slide for just a second to explain this to you. Now, since you have produced only 13.6 grams of urea, there has to be some of the ammonia left over because if you had 10 grams of ammonia, you would have produced more. Okay, of the urea. So the way to set this up is to do a stoichiometric calculation again. All right. One little bit more thing over here. Remember, if you see this, these two calculations are exactly the same. So if you want to save yourself some time, you can stop right here at the moles and compare the moles and then just figure out the grams. Okay, because the moles of urea that you calculate will also give you a smaller number for carbon dioxide, okay? So you can stop here also, although the step is the same for both, so it really doesn't matter, okay, too much. It's not going to waste too much time, but stopping at moles just saves you maybe two milliseconds. Okay, so let's do the second part now. How many grams of excess reactant are left? And remember, um, carbon dioxide is our limit. Okay, so to find the excess of uh, ammonia that's left over, as we said, we're going to start with the 10 grams of carbon dioxide and then uh, convert that to moles as usual. Now, actually, what we're doing is finding out how many grams of ammonia are consumed. So the mole ratio that we will use is for ammonia. So 10 grams of carbon dioxide, convert that to moles, moles of carbon dioxide down here, mole ratio. We have two moles of ammonia being consumed. For every one mole of carbon dioxide, once we know the moles of ammonia, then you convert that into grams of ammonia, you find the answer. This number should be less than what you started with, okay? So you started with 10 grams of ammonia. It should be less than that because carbon dioxide was the limiting reagent, okay? And we started with 10 grams of ammonia also. If this number is coming higher than what, uh, what you were given, then you did something wrong. Okay, so you need to go back and check your calculations. But we started with 10 grams of ammonia, so this number should be less than 10, okay, which we are fine now. So which means 7.73 of ammonia reacted. So then what we have to do is just subtract the two numbers. So 10 grams minus 7.73 gives us 2.27 grams as remaining, okay, of ammonia in there. 
And so therefore, 2.27 ammonia is left unreacted, which is the excess reagent. Limiting reagent was carbon dioxide that got completely consumed, okay, in the reaction. So now that we know how to do limiting reagent problems, you should be able to figure out excess reagents and limiting reagents, okay, using uh, two quantities. If you had three starting materials, your calculation would be just a little bit longer, okay, but the process is the same. One last thing that is remaining for um, this chapter is percent yield, okay, and percent yield gives us the efficiency of the reaction. What we've been calculating so far, okay, using stoichiometry is what we call theoretical yield, okay, theoretical yield, stoichiometric yield, because technically speaking, in a perfect world, if you're given a certain amount of reactants, you should get a certain amount of product, okay, and this is calculated, this is not reality, okay, reality is always going to be different than what is in theory, okay, because once you go in the lab and start working, uh, you will see things will come out to be different, and you can just think about your uh, separation lab and think about it that you started with a certain amount of starting material, and, and even during separation, just a physical separation, you ended up losing some material or forming some material, which you should not have. But in any case, um, whatever is the stoichiometric yield, that is a calculated amount. What you actually get in the lab is what is called the actual yield. And this is a measured amount, okay, because this is what you're actually measuring. What you do theoretical is only theoretical, okay, that is how it should be in an ideal world. So then the percent yield is actual yield over theoretical yield times 100%, okay? So both of these are in grams, so your final answer is actually a percent value. So let's do a problem for this one. It's actually quite simple. Same thing, urea, okay? And now we have 10 grams of ammonia, 10 grams of carbon dioxide. Limiting reactant was carbon dioxide as we decided before in the previous problem. Now, the problem is slightly different though, okay? And we already know the theoretical yield, but when this reaction is carried out, 9.3 grams of urea was obtained, okay? The theoretical yield was 13.6 grams, but the actual yield that is obtained is 9.3 grams. So then what is the percent yield, okay? And the percent yield then would be 9.3 divided by 13.6 times 100%. Okay, pretty straightforward. And that gives us our answer, which is 68% yield. That's not a very efficient reaction, by the way. Okay, and usually in industries, uh, people would like to have an efficiency rate of 99% if possible. Okay, because otherwise, all the other things are going to be just a waste of money. And then remember who pays for all of this? Yes, the consumer, okay? So why would you want to waste your money? So more efficient processes are better processes for industry and for the consumer. So the yields should be definitely in the 90s, okay? Those are supposed to be good yields, but this is just a hypothetical question anyway, all right? But in this case, 9.3 was what was obtained, 13.6 is what we should have gotten. Now, typically, if you know the efficiency of a reaction, so for example, you know that this reactions work in a 68% efficiency, then that is how you will design your experiment, okay? And so that is how you get the quantities and so on and so forth. So to review, you need to know three things over here. One is the limiting reactant, um, how to calculate for that. Remember, limiting reactant is the one that uh, when it finishes, the reaction stops. Then the excess reagent, the excess reagent is the one that's left over after the reaction has stopped. And it is the calculation where you have to do everything in reverse, okay, sort of. Um, and then, of course, the percent yield. You should be able to do all three of these um, from this PowerPoint.